right. Let's let's take a look at this. This is this is why I call Kaizo Mario uh, 2D Overwatch <laughs> or 2D Wrecking Ball. Like how many re how many tries does it take to beat some of these levels? Uh, this level took like 30 hours. Cool. Wow. I would lose my mind. Speaking of, I would. <laughs> speaking of flow state. I, I would ever lose hit that my mind like to restart this something like 30, 30 hours of time. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh, I do lose my mind. That's why I play Wrecking Ball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, no. Oh, no. I am a uh, one trick because I'm an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least Wrecking Ball's a very versatile hero. Yep. No, yeah, and I, I'm actively trying to, like, learn how to play Wrecking Ball with all different types of comps. I'm not just doing the same thing every time. Well, if you're going to be a one-trick, that's definitely something that's going to happen, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what, uh, sorry, what I do mean, you low is this? Uh, 2830 or so. Yeah. As, as far as, like, uh, Kaizo or any other competitive uh, task or sport or game is, uh, would you consider yourself like top 500 in in Kaizo or like any other game or activity? In Kaizo, I'm probably top 20. Wow! Wow! Okay. Um, I'm I'm one of the moderators for Super Mario World Central, so I play all the hacks that get submitted, uh, make sure to beat even the hardest ones, and determine if they're worthwhile. This because this is something that I always find interesting. Like you find people. Uh, uh, Bishu is probably the one who comes to mind uh, immediately, somebody who was professional in League of Legends and then became professional in Overwatch. Uh, and you find people, you know, like, well, he who shall not be named was professional MVP in Overwatch and then uh, right. started doing really well in Valorant. Uh, and, and, like, those have really high transferable skills, but I'm always kind of curious. Uh, I'm very curious about the people who are, um, like, really, really good in one task and then try and get really, really good at another task um, in a, like in a in a pretty different domain, like two D versus three D game, you know, FPS versus exactly. platformer sort of thing. Uh, so that's kind of like what I'm interested in here is because somebody who has achieved top twenty in the world at anything, you know, knows something about uh, procedural knowledge. I think right, is, is right. the easiest way to say. It. Like you have an acquired procedural knowledge about Kaizo that is not easily explained, but you have gone through the process of acquiring that um, yourself. So. I guess the first question sort of thing is like, uh, you know, if you're top 20 in the world in Kaizo, but platinum in Overwatch, why aren't you top 20 in Overwatch, in your own opinion? In my own opinion, it's, I mean, it's why I'm getting coaching. I don't know enough about the specific game, game sense, positioning, that kind of stuff, and I haven't uh, spent enough time applying it. Did you, um, get, uh, did you get coaching for Kaizo, or did you, like, take no, not no. a didactic approach to that? No, um, that was just uh, grinding it out. Yeah. So is is like getting the coaching something because, uh, like you don't know? Uh, are you approaching coaching from the perspective of accelerating the process, like acquiring that procedural knowledge faster, or helping us like let you know kind of what route knowledge you need to remember that is the most impactful, uh, or is it something where but you know like you've you've acquired procedural knowledge previously through an autodidactic fashion? Uh, is is that sort of thing where it's like you're you're struggling to take that same autodidactic approach to Overwatch, uh, when for some reason it worked in Kaizo? Yeah, I think I think it's a little bit of that last one. I think it's harder to, at least for me, like kind of like parse the individual pieces of Overwatch because there's so much going on. Whereas Kaizo 2D yeah. and you have a shell or you have a spring or you have a jump over an enemy and you know it's. <laughs> piece by piece. I guess that, whereas, is, that, yeah. that is kind of interesting, whereas Kaizo is, because Kaizo is the exact same things happen every time. Like, when you're doing something for 30 hours, it's the exact same level. Nothing changes at all, from what I understand, correct? Pretty much. Uh, mentally, maybe a little bit changes, but physically, interesting. no. Interesting. Well, I, I'm just, uh, yeah. I don't know, Ticket, do you have any kind of, like, introductory or foundational questions? Um, yeah, I mean, just pointing out that we've worked together before. This will be your third session. Oh, yep. Now, well, then yep. I will, then I will take a back seat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, take take lead then, Luke. Uh, yeah, I guess to talk about the few things we've touched on before, um, a big focus was uh, decision making around engages, whether or not we're engaging to win a fight or engaging just to make space, that kind of thing, yep. uh, as well as setting up behind those engages. So obviously, still going to be looking for that. 
this team composition looks a little bit weird to play with from Ball just off the bat. They've got a very slow back line. Um, so the amount of support you're going to get is going to be very spotty. There's no one like Ana to pocket heal you at range. Uh, you'll have, be relying on mega packs a lot. And the range of your DPS heroes is very long, but they are not going to be occupying the same space as you. So you're going to have to be very aware of what they're doing at all times, which is also something we've talked about is playing around your team comp, um, playing around the heroes that you are trying to enable. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I looked at that going into this, and I uh, I think I play a little bit more like trying to displace the tanks instead of uh, like isolating in the back line or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds good. I think we should be good to jump into it. I'm just writing okay. one note. Uh, all right. Okay. Learn about Kaizo off stream. <laughs> <laughs> Don't out me. <laughs> all right. Let's uh, let's get into it. So yeah, pretty standard um, Rhine comp from the enemy team. They're playing double shield, no Zarya, which means um, it's going to be very hard for your your backline to take space, your Zarya, Bap, Zen specifically. Hopefully your Widow and Faro should be able to find angles during times you're going in, though. This becomes more of a thing on defense, but uh, I did feel like for the majority of the game, the rest of the team was simply waiting until I did things. Mm -hmm. So that's that was, that was a little bit. I didn't know how to approach that at times. It could be just they know how, they have no other choice. If there's two shields, like right now, this kind of situation, there's two shields in their face. If you don't do something to disrupt them, or at the very least peel backline pressure off of them so that they can't maintain that shield pressure, um, it's very, very hard for people. Like, just look at your other four, four or five members. Uh, what are they realistically supposed to do? They can't really flank like you can. Uh, they can't push up through the shield. They'll just get spammed out and have to brawl tanks. So it, in this kind of situation, sometimes it is very reliant on your engages and your opportunities. Okay. Yeah, and there are going to be definitely going to be times where you can uh, go for uh, like a displacement as the main strategy. And you can definitely do that You know, if displacement is going to lead to elimination or if you need to build ult charge. I mean, fireballing through six people is an incredible um amount mm -hmm. of uh of ult charge right but especially right. in this situation here like uh you have the option there's an echo echo is very very susceptible to hit scan of which you are uh and you could you could instead of rolling through immediately here you could shoot the uh the echo or the ana i mean like uh you're you'll have to think about certainly consider dodging the sleep uh but you're at full health here uh, you have the ability to roll to health packs very easily. There's one just behind you to your left. You still have your shield sort of here where, you know, it might be more effective instead of rolling through the team to try and get some ult charge and some displacement. Uh, it's like for the front line to really truly peel for their back line to help out the Ana or for the uh, the Ana to help the Echo, that takes resources off of the front line where maybe your the rest of your team uh, could be more effective. So you don't have to, like, you can sit and poke because ball just like diva is a character who has deceptively long fall off range okay the other thing i will say about this kind of disruption like booping these tanks into your team keep in mind your team does not want to brawl these tanks so even though you're booping them a little bit out of position they're still not really at risk of taking any damage from your team because your team's still stuck behind this choke point um i think in an ideal world, your team would coordinate something where you boop them away from the choke and then your team takes space at the same time. For example, if they got enough room to get into the left uh, mini room there or potentially on the right and start walking towards the stairs. But obviously this is ranked. This is not a coordinated scrim or anything like that. So those kind of situations are very, very hard. And I think what Jane was saying of trying to divert the attention of the back line would probably be more beneficial in the long run for an extended okay. team fight. Okay. I, like I personally love positions like this because this sort of th mm -hmm. situation where you are kind of like on the flank or behind them, you're already forcing them to look in multiple different directions. And this is really where you are going to be strong, especially with double shields. Like they want to fight in a very linear fashion. Uh, and with you having the Zarya, the Hanzo, the Ash, like you're wanting to play like a triple angle uh, sort of thing or potentially, you know, Ash flank, Hanzo flank, you behind. Like you could do a full surround sort of thing. Um, where we've been talking in the last two VODs about potentially, uh, you know, focusing on whether it's like the front line or the back line, 
which one's weak, which one's strong, which one do you focus on? But another way that you can look at strength and weakness isn't frontline backline, but linear control versus surround control, uh, or sorry, linear control versus flank control. Probably okay. the better way to put that. So in this sort of situation, like this position is great, right? But you could also be in this position sort of thing. You could do the same thing. And then if the Ana uses the nade, I mean, that's huge, right? You want to be using your, your renewable resources, you're walking around, you're jumping, you're shooting to get cooldowns out. So if you were able to do that, uh, and get the Ana to have her nade out, then you could go for like a hard engage on her. You could use this position to slam into them uh, pretty easily sort of thing. So these kind of positions where you are just like sitting here and spamming, I really like them. I think that they're really quite good. And uh, uh, Hammond again does a surprising amount of damage at range. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the ult charge you're just getting for free. Where am I? There we are. Yeah, so you can you see the Sigma had to turn, drop the shield, so yeah, yeah that's great. And, and think about the amount of pressure you're alleviating from the choke just by Sigma relocating a shield to you instead of helping his Reinhardt. Now your team's getting a chance to walk in. This is, this is like textbook pressure release. Go for a bit of a hard engage there. Good to see you disengage once you see the slam doesn't get anything. Yeah. But like, and yeah, this, this was great. This was really good. Uh, but, you know, the, the taking the Sigma off, the Sigma retreated because he was like, I'm in a bad place. Ryan didn't mm -hmm. get the message, and then you got and set up another crossfire on the Ryan. Uh, this this was honestly fantastic. It uh, it gets worse as the game goes on. <laughs> Always does. <laughs> That's another situation where I think that it would have been fine to just hop out a ball and start machine gunning them. Mm -hmm. As long as you've got your grapple cooldown coming up, you can just sit outside of yeah. ball form yeah. uh, for as long as you want and then e immediately get away. I think that uh, in, ver in a lot of ways when I play ball, um, I think that <laughs> ball and Sombra are two of the hardest characters for me to just like pick up after a long break and get back into them uh, because there is a t very much a tempo to them uh, in that uh, you reload automatically when you're in the ball form after, oh shit. Um, Three? Seconds? Like, I want to say two. It's less than that. Chat quick. <laughs> it, it, it's like point one second over what the regular reload. Yeah, is. It, it, mm. it's 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 not. It, I'm, okay, chat doesn't know either. At there is it doesn't say. So this is one of those things where I don't need to know two the seconds. number because it's like you know it based off of the sound. It makes like a it makes well it makes like a reloading sound uh, sort of thing. Where <laughs> it's one of those things where if you are in these positions, in order to have like really good uptime and a really high tempo, you do have to kind of fi fall into this rhythm where it's like you can shoot, and then when you run out of ammo, instead of reloading, get into ball form and continue the engagement by rolling through, pop out on the other side where you've spent the ball form where you were in fire mode engaging, reloading, so that's, you can have a really yeah. high uptime. So that's like, that's one of the things that is always difficult for me to just like pick up ball after a long time, um, but kind of like chaining these... Uh, like clips of ammo into fireballs, into clips of ammo, into slams, things like that is going to give you mm -hmm. your, your ball uptime uh, really high. So I would I would definitely look to start more of these engagements with trying to uh, put a lot of damage into people. Because if you chip them down, you get a cooldown out before the engage. Awesome. You chip them down, and then instead of trying to like fireball through them, you could potentially like scoop and what is you scoop and poop, or you, you knock yep. them and then <laughs> fire, or you slam into poop them. and scoop. Hoop and scoop, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> loop to loop. Something like that has a better chance of actually getting an elimination. So. Okay. I will say, uh, since our first session, where you basically use no guns at all, there's been big improvement. Um, but yeah, of course, there's always room for more. Right. I've, I've uh, historically been afraid of shooting because uh, this is also <laughs> my first FPS. Mood. PC and, Mood. Yeah. <laughs> That's risky. Yeah. Yep. That was rolling I'm guessing main. you were trying to help the person who got hooked. Yep. But yeah, even in that situation, even if you do save them, a lot is being risked by your own body. That's another situation, just to point it out again, where ooh, I, I would have stayed on the high ground and shot. You know, the, the harder engages with the fireball and with the slams are really quite good if they're all ready. Uh, close to death, so you can do a commit. Okay. The amount of tension you're getting right now is absurd. The pressure you put out from the mines and then the follow-up uh, boop and slam on the hog caused them to just leave that fight in anger, trying to burn you down after the fact. So that was really, really good pressure release. Um, 
like Jane's saying, I think some better use of the high ground would have made these approaches a lot easier, a lot less risky. Uh, but at the end of the day, you did get the job done, so that was really good. Huh. I was actually concerned that the mines were just like really poorly placed because they escaped them like very quickly. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it didn't actually like pressure them at all. So like, it's obviously going to be preferable if you can get kills with your mines, but it's not always going to be possible. And you can use it just to split or to do straight up area denial. And at this point, you forced both of the supports out into the open, whereas previously yeah. they, had, they had a fortified position. So that was fine. You you like you don't always have to use mines to get kills. You when you do uh, mine, you can try and body block to prevent people from walking out. Or uh, you can also like if somebody has been forced to play away from that area, you can just set up to boot people back into them. Uh, mm -hmm. So like there's there are a very large number of variations for mine usage where you drop on the ground, drop in the air, and slam, or are all of those sort of things. So um, okay. one of the one of the things is like how much do you know about the actual a slam mechanic of ball. Um, I mean, I know that it's what is it like a hundred at the epicenter, and it drops off as it goes further away, and it stuns them for like little yeah. under a second. So, so one of the things that is not very commonly known uh, on wrecking ball for whatever reason is that the slam doesn't just knock people uh, vertically; it knocks people towards you. Um, yeah. So. It's like, you know, if you, because if, there's this mix of, like, you, if you're slamming people just at, at the edge of the range, right? if you slam here, and so uh, this is something that you're only going to be able to see if you look at Twitch, but if somebody's standing here, they will be drawn towards you, but take less damage, whereas if you slam right on somebody, they'll take more actual damage. So this is kind of going to depend, like, when you're actually trying to damage people or get uh, eliminations, you want to slam right on them to get maximum damage. But if you're trying to like bring people into the mines, you want to be slamming at max distance so they get drawn into them, sort of thing. Because the oh, mines yeah. are going to be what's doing the damage, sort of thing. So that was one of the things that when you went in, like you slammed pretty close to them, so they went up and down, and then they were able to run out of it. Or if you slammed farther away, closer to the center of the mines, uh, this would be, it would put them more in the center of it. It's usually like when you're actually trying to do a mine. If you go up and mine, you usually 180. Uh, so. Like, you, you swing up, you mine, and then you usually 180 because, like, even just slamming normally, it has a small forward travel. So if you 180, you will mine, kind of, like, slam back into either the center or just behind the mines and drag people, like, right into the center of it where they won't be able to escape. Um, okay. So it's, like, it, 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 this is one of the things that's kind of, like, really, really... Uh, there are... It's, like, you know, just the decision to slam is hard enough to decide when you should do it, but then when you are deciding to slam, it's, like, you know... Who are you going to be doing max damage to, and where do you want them to physically end up after they that knock up has actually completed it all the way through? Okay. Yeah, I had no idea on the uh, drawing closer part. Yeah. Keep going, Lou. Yeah, I think that was good. Don't have anything to add for once. <laughs> <laughs> I like the disruption you were doing um, to try and get them off payload, but I think at some point here you needed to decide to opt into a harder engage. And I would have liked to see you make that decision when you saw the supports coming out of the left room where the Mega is. If you could just like roll over there, boop them either back into that room so they can't heal anyone on point, um, or try to burn them down with your guns after you roll through them. Okay. Ideally, it's after something like uh, an Anna's Sleep comes out, but even just that space they were holding, uh, should have been very vulnerable, and we could have taken advantage of it. All right, chat is telling me that they improved the air control of people after pile drive slam. Do people have more control? And they're being yeah, and they can they can act a little bit sooner. Uh... It used to be like <laughs> it's it's still relevant though because the set distance you were talking about still exists. It's just their initial momentum can be stopped sooner. It's it's a weird thing you kind of need to get the feel it's, for. It's changes like that <laughs> that are so subtle that I don't notice them for like weeks after I've started yeah. playing the game. <laughs> oh, it's, uh, yeah. I completely forgot about that change, to be honest. That's why uh, we are better. Ooh, Ooh very risky. Yep. One. Like... <laughs> Got punished. One. Yep. They had all the CC of the world between Kree, Hog, and Ana all just sitting there and Sig. Uh, and two, you went for the mines after slamming, where you're the most predictable and the most likely to get punished. 
I'm sure you know, you already know, uh, but just to reiterate, getting those mind blocks. Oh, they're, they're not on the card. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it. Yeah, just that little free time of when you're committing mines is so crucial that you don't get punished during it that you need to make sure you get all your ducks in a row to actually yeah. get it off. Make sure you're avoiding CC. Make sure you're not slamming first because you want to be as either high enough to not be punished or high enough to uh, avoid certain things like flashbang, and then you commit to a slam. So one of the things here, again, with kind of like controlling attention and being more of a flank control comp rather than a like linear control comp, now they've swapped onto uh, the Sigma and the Roadhog. So like they're also playing more flank control here. Uh, but you're playing very forward, and the opponent only has to really look in one direction here. So you get this knock. Now, oh, did I miss it? I wanted to point it out. But let me just go back, because there's a chain of events here that I wanted to talk about. Okay. Uh, so it is right... I mean, right here, right? So you get antied by this Ana, but the more important thing here is that the Ana does not have her nade, and you still have your important cooldowns, being your slam and your grapple here, uh, this sort of situation. So, like, this should be, you know, in your head, you're like, all right, how do I get to this Ana? Uh, because she has become vulnerable. Uh, whereas, like, you're focused on this very linear front to, like, you know, just a very linear fight where... Yeah, you know, this Roadhog doesn't have to look in multiple directions in order to see your entire team. Whereas, like, if you were behind them, on a flank, on a high ground, you know, the Roadhog could look at you, or he could look at your team. You always want to be, like, forcing the opponent to be looking in two different directions. It gives them imperfect information, and it forces them to make a decision, which is always going to be, you know, imperfect, basically. So not only is their information imperfect, but their decision is going to be imperfect here. So uh, here, like, I would be probably going into the castle, uh to try and find a way to knock that uh, on a, into the open and then potentially slamming her. That's what I would be doing because I know that she's vulnerable. Whereas, like, she is in a very uh, healthy and safe position in order to heal uh, this Roadhog. And this Roadhog is not going to die to you. Uh, he's going to feed you a shit ton of ult charge, you and the Zenyatta, but he's not going to die. And this Ana is just going to uh, heal him a ton, right? So, And then after this, because you're continuing this linear fight, uh, there's another time where you roll into a Sigma who has his rock, and a Roadhog who has his hook. Now, you survive, but you survive because of the elo you're playing at. Uh, right. Where it's yeah. like, this okay. This would be instant death at higher elos. <laughs> oh, sorry, the, yeah. the Sigma did use his rock, but the the, mm. the Hog had his, uh, his hook, and he uses it right here and misses. Somehow. He's touching you with his fingers. He, yeah, I don't know how, <laughs> but the... How? What? Yeah. So this is the idea of... Yes, you want to fight for the space of your team, and that space of your team has is very limited, but that doesn't mean approaching it the same way like a Reinhardt would. Uh, you have so many more options for approach as Ball, specifically, that you want to use that to your advantage, so that, yes, this is the probably the general part of the map you want to be fighting for, but you don't want to be coming at the same angle as your team, just like Jane's saying. And you, the way you handled this on first point was perfect. You had a lot of pressure at the choke where your team was struggling, but you didn't try to just roll through the choke like with the rest of your team. Same thing applies here. Yeah, I mean, like, what you're doing would be way more effective if you just started from a high ground on a flank or behind, right? Just, mm -hmm. just shoot, and then especially, like, when you when you roll in, it gives the time for the opponent to be like, all right, they're rolling, I need to prepare my flash, I need to go for the hooks. It's just like, yeah, like, do everything you're doing just from a different starting point, point. you'll already yeah. start to see way more impact. Okay. I think a good way of thinking it, I guess... Maybe not if you're a one trick, uh, but if you compare it to other tanks who have resources other than positioning, like shields, like big cooldowns, uh, like Sigma's barrier or his his shift and stuff like that, uh, you don't have those kind of cooldowns to create space for your team. So you need to leverage positioning above all else in the way you approach the fight. And your positioning isn't that, a cooldown. You can just always be rolling. <laughs> exactly. So like, if this was the equivalent to Ryan, you walking in main is the equivalent of Ryan walking up with no shield. Okay. That's actually a really good way of putting it, Luke. <laughs> Thank you. Also, Carl Sagan for 42's living. in chat. So, hi, Carl Sagan. <laughs> he and I, uh, he and I have been trying duos with him on uh, Ana. And it's, oh, nice. Uh, not, not always great. <laughs> not <laughs> always, always great. <laughs> you isn't that Overwatch? In I love show, very obvious euphemisms. They are my favorite. 
You know, actually, uh, Panga is a freaking master's support now, too, if you know Pangea Panga. I actually don't. Oh. oh, okay. Another Kaizo player. We got a, got a number of us over in the Mario community who play this game. Nice. Yeah, that's death. So, yeah, third point here is going to be tough just in general. Your flanking options and your setup positions are near zero. <laughs> uh, so this choke especially is going to be very hard to get through, especially with someone like that Tracer marking you. Something I'd like to see is hopefully coordinating with some other member on your team, ideally your Zarya, for something like this bubble slam. Okay. <laughs> uh, because you're not going to be able to do much alone comparatively like what you were able to do alone on first and second points. Gotcha. The positioning just isn't strong enough for you here. And it's like, so this is, when I'm in a situation like this where um, like my team is stuck in a choke or something and I'm like Sombra, Ball, anything that can like really just exist in the back line, there isn't really anything wrong with actually existing in the back line and then using all the health backs that are floating around mm -hmm. uh, as a way to sustain you. There's no easily accessible mega on third, right, Lou? I'm not insane. There's one right uh, next to uh, where I am. There's this one. There's also one way back where I am in that little room. Uh, right there, there is one here, right. Okay. I, I don't know if I knew about this. <laughs> <laughs> I knew about the mini like when, around the when flanks. When is this one I guess it would be so used by ball players, right? But, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, it's just, okay. Uh, it's it literally just a dead-end closet. Like, yeah, it's what? just for Omega, <laughs> apparently. All right, I forgot that was a thing. Um but okay. yeah, it's like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you just existing in the back line just because, like, you're a threat. You're something that somebody else is thinking about. Like, attention is a resource. I mean, Lou and I are probably going to say that in every single VOD, um, <laughs> that, that attention yeah. is a resource. Controlling it is so important. And if people are looking behind or it's like, if you get, like, one the in the, the greatest world ever, you get two or three people chasing you. They're like, this ball is annoying. We got to deal with it. And they just... The, their attention is drawn off the choke and your team just goes through and the people who st still tried to hold the line, um, they die. So, and then it's like, if they don't pay attention to you, you just chip them away with your and then if they are, they then they have to heal their supports instead of the front line and if they get weak, then you roll through or you get in a situation where now you're rolling through from behind them into your team past the choke where you can get picks. So, uh, be comfortable existing entirely on your own in the back line because sometimes it's the only thing that you can do to move the needle. Okay. Especially if you're fighting at a hard choke when they're playing something like a Sigma and you're playing Zarya Ball. You, you're just not going to win that trying to fight through a choke in a, in a traditional way. Yeah, and to that end, what you're doing here, I think, was super valuable. And I think... I, I do still think, to my initial point, you need something like coordinating with your Zarya to get bubbled just to break through the choke and start setting up that space. Uh, but then obviously, once you've broken through, then you start looking for these angles and looking for this backline pressure. And just existing for as long as possible. Oof. That's rough. Rough day at the <laughs> office. I, uh, I face tank that for uh, somebody, probably. <laughs> I didn't see... I don't, or at least I don't remember exactly what happened around those mines, but they were in a really defensive position overall. And generally, mines are used to cut off enemy escapes when you're denying space with them, or just place directly on enemies so they're forced to react to them. Um, when they place them more over your team like that, unless like the enemy team is super hard aggressing and you need to stop them, um, it's very hard to find value out of them, because there's no way you're going to boop them into your team that far, and there's no one directly affected by it. Uh, this SR is 2800, right? Yep. Yeah, it's just 2830. 28. Yep. 2800. Uh, you're going to love the setup in the beginning of this uh, defensive point, Jane. Are we, are we spawn holding? Yes. Oh, yes. boy. I have... <laughs> no, no, I wish. That's what we were doing. I actually had a couple people in. Uh, discord watching when i was doing this and they uh said that this is the reason it needed to be the bot i uh sent in <laughs> oh no are we going to the skybox i'm curious what's gonna happen oh oh no <laughs> oh no oh, we're doing the illegal tech this isn't a pop spot though yeah it is is it it's a pop spot yeah yeah, yeah. 
Doomfist used to use this all the time, just like holding their E. Like they'd be like in the lunge animation and then they just drop whenever they want. He's not popping though. <laughs> it's legal, isn't it? That's, that's no, the, 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 right. he's, yeah, you're surfing right now. <laughs> this is very illegal. This is so bad. In, chat, in the Overwatch. Chat, like, when we talk about illegal, right. we talk about illegal in pro. The, so if you are in a, if you are in a spot that you're not allowed to stand in and you're stationary for three seconds, the game will pop you out of it. It will like give you a jump. Uh, and if you are in any spot that causes you to pop, it's illegal in pro play. Mm -hmm. But in ranked, they don't. Uh, uh, yeah. they, it's not enforceable. There's... Oh, I get punished anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> this is. Uh... Oh no! Oh! Oh! Oh, <laughs> oh no! So yeah, I guess. Oh. <laughs> Well, Jane just covered it, but yeah, that pop does happen. <laughs> oh my god. I've never seen it be quite so dramatic. <laughs> that's, so that's, a, we, that's a tragedy. Criminals yeah. will be punished! <laughs> we, uh, we, we get steamrolled a little bit because of that. Oh, uh, yeah? <laughs> oh, that's funny. <sighs> All right, that was the first point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, G go next. We got this. <laughs> we got this. GG, go next. <laughs> I think this this is kind of one I want to look at here, especially because I I definitely lost focus after that happened. Oh, yeah, I, how ridiculous it was. That so re repeat after me. Unlucky. Unlucky. <laughs> That's all you have to say. Now it's just unlucky. Move on. There's, yeah, the there's physics. nothing else to say. Laugh, the, say unlucky, GG go next. We go again. The, the <laughs> physics is transphobic. That's yep. all I got. That, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Bonk. A lot of shooting the, the stone walls. Yep. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> That's a lot of shields. Oh, you're still taking so much damage. So ideally in those situations, obviously, you know this, but uh, if you are just going for that disruption, you have, you've planned your way out as well as your way in. So you're using your fireball, not just to go through people, but to end up far enough away from them that you are out of danger. Yeah, you definitely got frazzled by that death, yeah. didn't you? Yep. Yeah, yep. you're full we're, we're autopilot a lot right now. You're engaging. full <laughs> autopilot right now. That is unlucky. I am the 100... Other... Sorry, go ahead. 100% still laughing in yeah. uh, the Discord call. <laughs> hey, your team won the fight. That's big. Yeah. I was I was going to say, the other approaches before that one where you died... Oh, no. Where you were... Deploy shields. Retreat! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> full power to the forward shields. Uh, the other approaches before that fight where you died were actually like not bad and like coming in through a flank and stuff like that were good. Okay. It's just your team wasn't ready for those engages, so it yeah. kind of didn't amount to much. Do you get this? Do you get this? Uh, not at all. Oh, that was such a good setup Close. though. That was, yeah, that was good tech. Good using the momentum of the slam to stay alive. Stalling payload now. We've got trance so we can try and find some value now. I would have liked to see you go aggressive as soon as you saw Trance coming out, because you knew, at least you should have known, that you were, you'd were you be safe to damage yeah. once you engage. And then maybe, if you get enough damage in before that grab comes out, we can turn that into kills. Yeah. But just a rough fight overall. And then the only other thing that you could have potentially done is when you saw that the beat was coming out, uh, the McCree was far enough away and on a flank that he didn't get the beat. Uh, okay. So you could have engaged on him. So mm. that's one of those situations where it's like, you know, it's in that middle of the fight, you, uh, you know, they've got that beat. You're not going to get anything. I mean, we can probably go back. Uh, what, is this going to be too far back? Pretty close. Yeah. So the trance is going to come out at this point, right? I would definitely agree with you. You can get out of there and then potentially work on trying to get the fade out of the Moira or killing the Hanzo, depending. Um... But then the other thing here is that as soon as the grab comes out like this, I would be looking to try and roll through that and then potentially get a slam. So I'd like roll through 
and then try and like jump off this thing to get, get enough altitude down. to slam into it. But then okay. seeing the beat come out of that, right? The only other option that you have is their McCree, who is sitting right here right now. Um, yeah. So well, only real tell for that was the sound cues. The sound and cues. Well, it's. Yeah. Yeah, sound cue and hit marker told you that he was here. I also Ash dying, I suppose. <laughs> oh yeah, I suppose, but uh, but yeah, and then it's just kind of like experience to know that uh, like you sound barrier, you're not going to do enough damage. They're dragoning, yeah. uh, so you need to clutch, and the only way you can clutch is find a vulnerable target that you can hard counter, and uh, McCree would be the one to do that on. So mm -hmm. okay. Tough spot overall, though. Yeah, can't it, blame you for yeah. So this is kind of like a situation where you're you're already a little bit on violin because you're frazzled. Um, and yeah, this is like, you know, improvising in a fight like this can be very, very hard and chaotic. Mm -hmm. okay. So close to getting that Zarya off. Yeah. And it's like, um, I suppose one other thing that I'll say is just like, just because you should doesn't mean, like, or just because you can doesn't mean you should. It's like you can stall on ball, right? But if stalling is just going to delay the inevitable, there's not a lot of point to it. Whereas if, like, if you're stalling specifically to get respawns or to prevent cap until somebody, like, you get reinforcements, you know, those are situations where it's good to stall, but uh, stalling to delay the inevitable is, yeah. Like, if you need to get kills to win, stalling's not the play, even if you can In, in this kind of situation, too, stalling can be actively bad if you get some of your vulnerable members a close spawn. Like, if your, uh, your Kree or your Hanzo got a close spawn because you were stalling too long, uh, and they die again because of that, because they're steamrolling after gapping the point. It could be really bad. Yeah, trying to get those mines in, you're going to die. Oh, oh, the lamp! Oh, you're Pretty going, you're going oh, in! Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> Huge! Yeah, a bit risky. I think we're still tunneling on fight, 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 fight. Uh, not really readjusting, not setting up positioning, setting up rollouts and stuff like that. Oh, I thought that was going to be a kill. Oh, it was. The Zen finished him It off. was, yeah. Ooh. I think that's GG. Unlock. Oh, no, so it's yeah. not done yet. Oh, yeah. Both we still, teams got, we still got overtime. You just got <laughs> rolled. <laughs> yeah. oh. At least we got time. At we least we got time. The spoiler is that we do win this game. Hog champ. Despite Big my dubs. best effort, I couldn't get a lot <laughs> uh, in the last two days for this. Oh, shucks, damn. You weren't able to lose despite your best efforts. My best efforts, yeah. <laughs> we, yep. I gave up a yeah. whole point by myself, and it didn't happen. Yeah, as your coach, I'm heavily disappointed you keep winning. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you keep winning after getting coaching? This is your your third coaching session with us? Yep. Yeah. Nice. And I've gone up, uh, I think a good 1,100 since the first one. Damn. Clip that, put it on the website. Clip that, put that on the website. <laughs> <laughs> Your uh, check will be deposited through PayPal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it is time to act. All right. We got a Roadhog now. No more Zarya. No more Bubbles. I remember when this rollout was like first discovered for like Doomfist players and Fara players. It was the craziest thing. Just patience Ooh. here, I guess. Mm -hmm. We already talked about it on the first round, but... Yeah. Oh, that's a great one. So... You know, it's like, these are little things where I, I mean, it's one of those things that I harp on all the time, but uh, like, and this is going to be, a, I'm going to apologize for like spraying this on you, but what was the important cooldown that was used during you rolling through them? Did you, did you hear any kind of like cooldowns that you're specifically looking for? Um, I mean, I was looking for... The uh, Ana anti, probably the sleep. Yeah. Um, so even the, even the BAP putting yeah. off the. Uh, so the sleep is the one that she used but missed while you rolled through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. But it's like, you know, these are the cooldowns that some you'll be able to see visually, but primarily you're going to be listening to them based off of audio. Um, yeah. And because this sort of thing, like when, when, when I hear like a, a cooldown 
get used like that. Whether it is the anti, like the anti is not a big deal for Ball because you like you can you've got your master shields. You got like 600 HP. Like heck them anyway. You're probably not getting <laughs> a lot of healing from the rest of your team. Regardless, it's not like you're a, a Reinhardt who got antied while you're getting coalescence or something like that. In the big scheme of things, Nade is like yeah to Ball, whereas Sleep okay. is is pretty dangerous, especially because they can chain those. Um, or potentially they can sleep you right after you tried to use grapple to get away to cancel the grapple. Very dangerous things. Um, whereas anti doesn't cancel your grapple. Yeah. Uh, so there's like this roll through, right? That one, just be a little bit more patient, shoot, then roll. Uh, but then this one. So the only reason that this one was effective, uh, that this roll out like, so this sort of setup would normally be bad, uh, because you're engaging into a linear composition. They're playing Ryan Zarya. They are a linear comp. They're playing Bap, McCree, Hanzo. That is so much linear damage, and you're rolling right at them. The only reason that this play is good, and maybe it was intentional, maybe it's unintentional, I'm not psychic, uh, was you basically saved your Roadhog doing it, right? You go all the way through, uh, and without this play, the Roadhog would have died here. You go through, and then right that noise there is Anna's yep. sleep, right? So... Um, and as sleep being used means that you can still uh, stay aggressive. Whereas beyond that, it depends whether you kind of like uh, stay at range and shoot or whether you just like really go to town on them uh, during that time period because you are a little bit safer. Especially since the Roadhog is purpled, he needs some time to uh, stabilize and get combat effective again, race basically. So this is a situation where it would be grab a health back as soon as possible and then go for another roll because you are pretty safe with that CC cooldown gone. Uh, and okay. like the status of those cooldowns, the, the CC cooldowns especially is something that on ball you need to be actively tracking to know how aggressive to be. Okay. So I do have a question with that. Yeah. Um, and it's I guess from my point of view when I was playing, um, I wanted to continue diverting attention over there without rolling back through so that my team could push. Mm -hmm. Like that that was the act of thought, and I guess I'm wondering on balancing that versus the act of like roll through back to the front blue do you want to answer that so one thing i think you might be forgetting is the pay the the point and the amount of pressure you're exerting just by existing on the point um i think even without committing to this slam for example you are or were you talking about like before this like the initial roll back through to your team to the choke uh yeah um no, no, no. This one. This one. Okay. Yeah. So even you, ex even without the slam keeping everyone here, you existing on the point was automatically pulling them back to you. They were not in a position because if you booped them back to commit on the the poke damage they found on Roadhog, so they can't commit to a fight over there. Um, so their default, I think, if we just watch this from third person POV, you could see their default reaction was to walk back to the point as we see them all here. Like as soon as you boop them all back, they they can't. They decide they can't net a kill on the Roadhog. So if they decide, okay, we need to stabilize on point because if we don't uh, and we stagger too long over here, then we're going to give up a tick or two. Yeah, look at them all. You've already got their attention. And I think right now, like in your third-person camera, seeing where they are, all you have to do is just wait for your grapple to come back up, wait for them, wait for your team to come around a corner, uh, and then then go for something like this. Okay. okay. And I Imagine if your Roadhog was full HP right now looking for a hook and you slam six people. That's a free kill. Okay. And one of the things is, like, you don't have to use the payload as cover here. Like, you can use, the, you know, the far edge being a little bit farther away because uh, you can retreat to this mini health pack or that one there to get a little bit of 75 extra HP. Like, any time you can get this this health pack there. Whereas, like, if you are waiting for that grapple to come back, like, if you see that they're retreating to the point, uh, you can leave, get that health pack, and then probably still return and do a roll through before their cooldowns come back up. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yeah, I think your the actions you took were really, really good. It's just your timing was a little bit off from the rest of your team. So this slam it probably isn't going to net much. Easy. And it gets you killed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, your team was probably like one to one and a half seconds away from being ready to commit to that. And since they weren't getting under pressure anyway, like the, t the enemy team was already backing up to point, we had so much space to work with. Ooh. Bit dangerous rolling that deep without scouting Liliana is first. Um, you kind of see her halfway through your rollout and decide to commit on her, but all she has to do is wait. I remember I was a little uh, uh, overly aggressive because of the time left. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this is going to be one of those situations where I'm going to give you uh, horrifically conflicting advice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, because I've been talking about like having these situations where you try and get a lot of value and keep this high tempo and this pattern between rolling and shooting and rolling and shooting and rolling and shooting uh, sort of thing. But at the same time, there are going to be situations where it's better to go for an assassination or be decisive about one target to get an elimination on one key target. Uh, okay. And, you know, there's going to be, when you don't have the opportunity to uh, find those key picks, this is where you want to be kind of forcing the opponent to use a whole bunch of resources or bleed through their resources so that they get to the point where somebody is vulnerable. Uh, but in these kind of like overtime situations, you kind of need to engineer or Houdini these situations uh, into existence where you can get uh, one pick, like just this generic damage. Uh, is not going to be sufficient because you are in overtime. You need to make a play now, sort of thing. You need to you need to commit uh, now. So there are times uh, where you want to be doing these really high tempo, good rhythm plays between shooting and fireball and slamming and blah 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 blah. But then there's also times where you need to play kind of like a doomfist plays. Where doomfist, you know, he basically doesn't participate in the fight. He lurks, he flanks, and then he presses three buttons. Somebody dies in the team fight is one. And he's not like. He's not like super brawly like a McCree or a Reaper. I mean, even Reaper. Some. I mean, those are probably bad examples because both McCree and Reaper can play this way. A McCree can flank or hide and flash fan. A Reaper can teleport into the backline and pew pew pew. Um, Doomfist is probably <laughs> the person who's most like this, but you definitely need to have it in your repertoire. Where uh, in an overtime fight like this, there's a key individual who you just need to focus on assassinating uh, okay. instead of consistently getting value. So there are there is a kind of like. We've been talking about the like really high effort, uh, like uh, min-maxing the amount that you get out of each cooldown, uh, positioning yourself to get value out of these cooldowns, chaining the machine gun into the fireballs and things like this. Uh, but then when you there are a, you, you, a different play style that I think that you need to develop, and I don't think that you have right now, is like the the hunter assassin, where it's like there is a Zenyatta, there is a Hanzo, there is a Widowmaker, there is an Ana and I am going to stalk and hunt and assassinate that person at the earliest opportunity. Uh, or at the mm -hmm. very least, I'm going to make them a non-factor. And this was this is a really common play style to have like higher levels in the Overwatch League, where um, I don't remember which season or stage it was, um, but there was a point in time where the entire meta was basically Winston chases uh, Widow around, not to kill her, just to remove them from the fight. You know, it's like, it's this sort of situation where like there's a 5v5 happening, or in some cases a 4v4, because there are these two like individual duels happening uh, elsewhere. It's like if there is a character uh, who it is more impactful for you to take them out of the fight than you to be in that fight, you can just stall them out or just assassinate them. Uh, and then especially on Ball, uh, especially when you go against like higher level Widows, where you, it is going to be your job to unilaterally shut that person down, eliminate them, assassinate them. Um, anytime they're alone or sometimes even if they're in a group, uh, that's going to be your job. No, yeah, I uh, definitely, um, you know, to quote Yeetle, uh, Widow is AKA priority number one. Um, I do like actively harass Widows and make yep. them go Sombra on me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the real victory. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there have been plenty of like Overwatch League games even where both teams are running a Widow and a Ball and it just turns into a 4v4 because those other four heroes are just running around the map. Ooh, yep, missed that one. Oh, yep. Okay, we make it out. The great escape. The great slam. Get him, he's one. Oh, you can kill him. Yeah. Yeah, Big. we can't follow second after that, don't we? Pretty sure. There is one thing I wasn't going to point it out earlier. Lou did, where you spent a little bit of time in the last round about like shooting concrete walls. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, so it is very much need to be like a force of habit sort of thing, where it's like if you're not hitting anything, you're not shooting. Um, so you're wasting a lot of ammo shooting air right now. So. Okay. 
that's just going to come down to micro adjustments in your aim itself. Yeah. Um, even going into like a practice range, I mean, shooting moving bots. The thing that I recommend for this is like tracer 1v1s because it's like as oh, soon yeah. as a person blinks or as soon as you blink, uh, you know, the practice of like stopping shooting at when you're reacquiring and then shooting as soon as you have reacquired. Uh, that's mm -hmm. like the, I mean, it's, it's, it takes a while to get it into your head. So uh, I love tracer 1v1s for that. Uh, if you want to do that as like a warm up with some of your friends before you get in, Tracer 1v1s are great if you need to practice trigger discipline. This is very dangerous. Yeah, if that Hanzo was a McCree, <laughs> yeah. you might have been dead. Again, live in their backline. See where their May is? Imagine if you were there with her and just going in for a slam at this time. Mines are good, but it might be too little too late. Yeah. Unlock. Yeah. Tough fight, given all the alts coming up for the enemy team, but to give yourself the best shot there, like we said in the first round, live in the back line. Okay. Just lurk back there. Even if you're not setting up for anything specific, just being there will give you more options rather than being with the front line. Okay. And realistically, no one... There was no need for you to be like pushing payload. You had other members of your team that could do that. I did not entirely trust the other members of my team, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty standard for them. That's that another, can be the reality. Day that ends in y. <laughs> I we are Sorry. we are quickly coming up on our time. Oh, um, it's, pug, it's informal pugs next. We can go over. Okay, we can get we can finish this defense. Good. Oh, for sure. All right. Are we going to the same spot? Are we trying again? Oh, hell no. no. <laughs> Coward. <laughs> Do it again. Assert I mean, your dominance surely, on map geometry. Yeah, lightning never strikes twice in the same spot, right? Yep. <laughs> if you're metal and you're high enough, it will. <laughs> yeah, maybe Wrecking Ball on a rooftop isn't the greatest example for that. <laughs> Don't worry, I still fuck up. <laughs> I remember this but, very but clearly. But do we learn now. from it? You don't fuck up. You perform a suboptimal play. Yeah, that's no, fuck, yeah, I that's up. okay. That's, that's a, a suboptimal that, play. That, 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 that. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you gotta ask yourself, what's gonna happen after you slay him? Yeah. Realistically, like, what's your team gonna do? Uh, oh. Just looking at where they're set up, there's nothing even they really can do. This may wall was even yeah. more than I was expecting. They, like they had three uh, <laughs> they had three stuns. You're Yeah. Yeah. Unless you've got a Reinhardt like charging in with you and in your May ready to rush in with Lucio speed, this is uh this is a no no. I can tell you <laughs> I can tell you exactly what my thought process was. And I know okay. it was dumb. I'm but curious. I can't tell you. <laughs> so so after like so I've been doing a lot of like you know, rolling through the back line and blah, blah, blah. Um, I saw the Rhine and I saw the Lucio and I went, oh shit, they're going right through. And I thought I was going to miss my opportunity. But then mm. they paused right at the choke. Yeah. And this so like your opportunity is, is not gone sort of thing where like you could have stayed up there and you could have sprayed. Like if they're going through, one of the things that that opens you up for is to just spray their Ana, right? I. Uh, like spray down their Ana so that you can slam and get the kill on them. I was like, you, your your slam will do 100 damage if you land it right on them, right? You just need to kind of chip somebody down to half. You know, that'll f cause them to play differently. It'll cause them to have to use cooldowns on you or the Ana have to use on, uh, the nade on herself. Like if you force an Ana to use nade on herself, that's, that's great. Um, but them rushing through like that and ignoring you is actually a blessing to you. It's not, a, it's not something that you have to react to because that means that Squishies are going to be moving through and they're going to be focused on their plan which is their plan is going to go be forward go forward support their reinhardt it's not going to be make sure the ana doesn't get fucked by a ball or like you know keep make sure that the the, the mccree and the uh the hanzo stay alive sort of thing it's like they they don't really have good single target healing they're not uh you know unless the, the lucius are is going to use his amp for speed not for heal so the ana is going to have to if you want to heal red ninja or, or uh like the uh the mccree or the hanzo on the enemy team like the honor has to draw attention away from the reinhardt and like you by being up here putting more pressure splitting the honor's attention uh even if you don't get a kill on to the squishies you'll probably cause the enemy reinhardt to die 
uh, because he's being completely unsupported. So them being like this aggressive actually plays perfectly into both your hands and your positioning here. Okay. Okay. The so. only other thing I want to add is you mentioned you were worried about missing your opportunity. This location is not an opportunity. This is just feed central. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like we said before, you want you need to engage when you're looking for engage opportunities, it needs to be in range of your team, whatever your team comp is. If it's flankers, if you had a full dive team, maybe you could make this work. Um, but you also, not just you, but everyone needs to be set up for that play. So you going in like this may look like a good opportunity for you because they're all grouped up, but it is not a good opportunity for your team. Okay. I will press the Anything play else? Button. All right. <laughs> yeah, pugs are after this. If you do want to play Pugs, make sure you're on the Pico Discord. Donk. Yeah, we actually do not play any defense point A this entire game because of me. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> great slam, denying their retreat. Building up some free charge. Reinhardt shield exists. Oh, mate, where was May? Was she all oh, the way like she on was their side way of the joke? back there? Yeah, she was back left. <laughs> I didn't even see her. She fell off at the spot where like ball goes around the outside on offense. Ooh, nice. Oh, the, that's a great. This is really game. nice. That's really nice. That's the opportunity you're looking for. Unfortunately, we did go down two members right before. Still, that was really good. That was a perfect time to do yeah. a tank disruption. Okay. Imagine if your Hanzo or your Mei was on the flank towards the mini room, like around the right side of the pillar from defensive POV, and they that just completely opens up their back line because there's just no more tanks there. You mean imagine if Butter. your teammates hadn't fed? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was their turn after mine. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, just to, it's, it's revenge. It's revenge on team. Scouting, scouting, scouting. I like it. Onk. Ooh, you went airborne. Oh, yeah. Lucio boop, I guess. Oh, that was a cute grapple. I don't know if that was intentional. That was not. I remember. No, no, you you gotta take those. You gotta <laughs> take. Ah, uh, yeah. Top 500 oh, ball. No. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh. <laughs> Just missed the slam and then couldn't readjust fast enough. So. First thing about the initial engage, again, I'm worried that your team wasn't ready to follow that up. If your Mei was there like with Blizzard, ready to throw it on the cart, when you go for that slam, you wipe the whole team. Or if your Hog was ready to hit a hook at the second you slam, it's just a free pick. But it seems like you're a bit ahead of the team again. This is nice, denying the momentum from the Shatter. And you're gonna try and get the knockback in? Yeah. You can get Ooh, out of this. You can get out of this. No! This. No! Oh. <laughs> yeah. I actually... Just a bit too soon. Yeah. And it's one I of those... Actually... So... Sorry, go ahead. What were you saying? I was gonna say, I actually um, actively decided to go for the ground pound because if I was swinging back and forth, it would have... Uh, yeah, just oh, oh, no, the, more the ground pound is the, the right decision to get back onto the high ground. Um, so... Just, you were just barely not high enough yeah, when so, you did so it. Yeah, so one of the other things is that... Um, let me just hop into custom game here and kind of show you this is another tech we talked about the slam tech let's talk about another ball tech here uh i can vault. you don't want to do it on the halloween version no <laughs> Tech the halloween version so um ball like we talked about it earlier where balls uh pile drive has a little bit of a forward momentum right yeah so yep. this is this is the sort of situation where if you if you back up holding control it just triggers automatically right Yep, uh, yep, but, yep. But if you're close to a wall or something like that, that forward momentum doesn't actually take you back on. So, like, right. if you're doing this, if you're doing... Oh, no. This is going to be... I wonder if I can just get in the same situation you were in, actually. Where did you grapple? Like, right here? Yep, right there. Yep. Yeah, so it's like, if you are going to get onto high ground, you actually need to be a little bit farther um, away from the wall. It's like you need to have a gap because if you're actually that close, the uh, the forward momentum doesn't carry you on. So you need to actually be mm -hmm. 
a little bit farther away from the wall so that the arc will actually get you back onto the ledge. So let me kind of yeah. let me try and because the momentum that. starts as soon as you hit control. Yeah. Not when you're at your peak. So you grappled like right there, right? So. So in order to get on, you have to be a little bit farther away, like that, and then you can get back on. Because if you, if you ride the wall and then try and slam on, you're just going to go vertical and then straight back down. So you have to have a tiny, tiny gap away so that the arc, uh, like because the forward momentum is applied, like Lou said, uh, at the moment you press control, right? So if you are touching the wall, it's not like you are going to have um, consistent momentum and the arc will continue after you've gapped up. You get that momentum at the very start in the same way that a monkey gets uh, forward momentum the moment he presses the jump. Uh, I don't remember the terms for the different kinds of momentum that you get from cooldowns, but Guardian Angel is like continuous impulse, uh, and then uh, like monkey jump and uh, ham and slam are, uh, we'll call them like, I don't know. One time. <laughs> one momentary instantaneous impulse, continuous impulse and instantaneous impulse. We'll just use those words. So. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, you just need that tiny, tiny gap so that the arc can actually uh, take you up and onto the onto the uh, platform above. But, okay. yeah. All right. Yeah. Where were we? We were Eichenwald, right? Traveling to Eichen ready for battle. Somewhere around here. Oh yeah, this was the scouting and the slam. There we go. Should be. All right, we're yep. back. Yep. Yep. Right here. Oh, I like that one. That was good. Good tech. You've been at disadvantage this whole fight because people just keep dying, unfortunately. Yep. Um, maybe you could have you could have tried to make like a carry play here, and instead of going back to the cart and disrupting the tanks to ease the burden on your team, because your team was already struggling so much, uh, you could have tried to even the odds by getting a kill on like, the Ana. Okay. But difficult call to make. Ooh. Okay. Oh yeah, this is a win winning play. Uh, yeah, so I was gonna say that was a bit early, but your Baptiste and your May were ready to follow up, so that was good. That's great, yep. Slam to disrupt the Nano Zarya. <laughs> Beautiful. Good finishing plays here. Yeah. Good, good note to end things off on there. And the uh, BM mines. Yeah, I think that like not only the uh, the discipline on kind of trigger discipline, but also aiming for the head in that last fight. Um, in that last fight, especially fighting against the Zarya, and a few times when you've been fighting the tanks, you've been going for center of mass, um, and and that's pretty common for people who are new to FPSs uh, and everything. But it is going to be better. Like just as a default, uh, you need to at least be trying to hit the head. Uh, so Zarya's especially. I mean, it's a two times multiplier. Uh, the higher mm -hmm. you get, the more headshots people are going to hit on average, and you're just like your lethality is going to need to increase. Even if, as you start doing everything, uh, you know, strategically correct, if you aren't able to execute tactically, you know, you're going to fall behind pretty, uh, uh, pretty quickly. And that is definitely speaking from experience. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's like it's it's going to suck. You're probably going to miss more shots uh, than you could hit if you were just aiming for center of mass, but. Uh, as long as you are not missing more than 50% of the shots on the head, you're still going to be doing the same, if not more, damage. Uh, so, and you you need to start working on it now, or else that skill is going to be something that is going to be underdeveloped, uh, and that is a very slow, slow one to improve. Uh, okay. So, trigger discipline of shooting, and like you know, this this goes for like McCree players or Hanzo players. Even if there's a Reinhardt with a shield up, even if they're you're shooting something behind the shield, like even if there's a shield up, always shoot ahead behind the shield you never know when that shield's gonna drop um and it's just free practice anyway so zarya with a bubble up shoot her in the head anyway uh reinhardt okay. with a shield up shoot him in the head anyway uh always be shooting for that head uh 
it's it's gonna you know you're going to need that extra damage um, sooner or later because you are quickly approaching diamond and at that point once you start hitting diamond individuals lethality starts increasing very very quickly okay. huh.